Greetings, family. This is Brother Ron. You are listening to and watching We All Be News. News Free Dixie for the 21st century. Can you dig it? But the man of the hour of the moment of this Trump geist, the man is the undisputed heavyweight champion of unfiltered truth <laughs> and justice for just us, the one and only, the honorable Judge Joe Brown. How you doing, Brown? All Brown. right, young man. Glad to be here. It's an honor to have you on, man. Boy, it's so much going on. But you out right now. You helping create the narrative for us, the people. We appreciate it. But you're one of our stars. You're the up and coming. <laughs> I appreciate it. I, I, I accept that endorsement. Well, I got to ask you, Judge, I got to ask you, because you a Memphis guy, and you know Memphis law, you know Shelby County all that very well. I got to ask you about your take on the Young Dolph murder trial where they found that guy, Justin Johnston, a.k.a. Straight Drop, they gave him life in prison. What, have you been keeping up with that case or that trial by any chance? Somewhat. It's business to me. I did it for 50 years. I'm kind of retired. Because yes, sir. Question on it. Yeah, but what do you think about the fact that uh, they found him guilty so fast? I mean, it's quite damning, I guess, with the evidence, but it, it was a person dressed in a mask. Was it really him? And also the fact that uh, Big Juk, the uh, brother of young Yotman Yo Gotti, who was, no, he's the, he was the second in command of the, of the record label, they're claiming that he was the guy that uh, confirmed the hit. He provided the money for the hit. Well, you know, when you get organized, criminality you get some problems and sometimes they get beyond the local district attorney's office and what the they conceive of the word that's out there is that the guy that just went to trial was taking a dive because he messed up and he can get life or he can die for some other things Dolph himself knew that it, things were going to get rough before it happened and it is what it is and they do what they do uh, the truth of the matter is is unless somebody comes right out and starts running his mouth uh, homicides are pretty hard to solve when the killer has no personal connection with the victim or it's not in the perpetration of a robbery or something and the fool is caught on camera like tends to be right now or you do something stupid uh mm -hmm. just a little quick anecdote i had a case in my courtroom it was a drive-by situation five people got shot three or four of them died they caught the idiots because they went to kinko's and xeroxed 300 copies of the commercial appeal article and they autographed them saying it was us <laughs> and started handing them out bragging about it so mm -hmm. i don't know i didn't keep up with it it was just business as usual in that industry there's a lot of money to be made to all sorts of compromises that happen and people that borrow money people that get others to invest in a project they have typically some big score selling some kilos and it doesn't work out or grams and it doesn't work out and somebody winds up getting snuffed so it is what it is but what do you think about the fact that uh yo Gotti's brother's been dragged into this he was uh deceased they killed him at the beginning of the year actually and now they're saying that he was the guy they helped finance the so-called hit on young, I mean, young Dolph. Maybe in a lot of deaths, just look like one thing aren't really for that reason. Uh, there is an active trade in, um, what shall we say, arranged uh, passings mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. Memphis is unique in that it is probably the first degree murder capital of america but most of those murders are passed off as accidental or natural deaths right 
and uh, nobody really hears about them. So they get underreported and they're done professionally. Sometimes the professionalism is bad. Mm -hmm. That particular wipeout on Gotti, um, you know, Young Dolph, I mean, that's old time ragged hit. You take him mm -hmm. out of a confection shop broad daylight and he's got his back turned to a large plate glass window that's just not good when somebody's after you and there was an attempt out on the west coast uh, mm -hmm. and down in florida too so i mean how much forewarning do you have to have uh, before you react to it with proper discretion see a lot of times what you'll find with some of the folk that do some of the crazy stuff out in the streets mm -hmm. and some of the celebrity artists, uh, they have some personal problems and they're suicidal. That's why sometimes they go out when they do drugs and sometimes um, their lesser brethren go out suicide by cop. Yes, sir. There's also suicide by neighbor, suicide by circumstance. And they know they've messed up their life that's inside their own skulls, not the one that said everybody's looking at aren't too cool. So they've given up and bam. The interesting thing to get into the mind of the perpetrators and the victims of some of these things. Yeah, I'll just look at the body language of Justin Johnson. He, it's like he just realized finally that he really screwed up his life uh, from his body language. I'm not an expert, but the fact that Cornelius Smith, uh, the other alleged killer, singing like a canary, singing like a like, uh, like Aretha Franklin, whoever, uh, all this stuff which is fascinating to me. The fact that they uh, did they hit allegedly for a hundred thousand, but only got eight hundred dollars? What do you think about that? Yeah, but I'm thinking probably somebody else got it. I had a, a would be father in law back in mm. 1971. I, his daughter was absolutely drop dead gorgeous and beautiful. We were engaged, and he used to run the numbers bank for the mob out in South Central LA. Mm -hmm. He was from Louisiana, kind of a Geechee looking guy. Looked Italian, but he mostly black. Mm -hmm. And he messed up on some money. Mm. So they gave him a choice, die or take a dive. So he wound up taking the dive. And when he got out, they gave him kind of a retirement, which was some apartment buildings and some hamburger stands to run. Mm -hmm. So he had to take that dive and he wound up doing one year, one day in the California penitentiary system because he was instructed to take that dive. Wow. Mm -hmm. You know. Do you think it's... Oh, go ahead. I'm sorry, sir. Go ahead. I mean, I didn't have anything to add on that. Yeah, I, I, but what do you think about what well, the guy said, uh, Cornelius Smith, the you know, alleged co killer? Uh, he said that, oh, he confirmed that 50000 was paid for attorney fees from uh, the music label in question, like Yo Gotti's music label, where his brother was the second in command. What do you think about that take? I have no idea. If somebody got into it, they might find something different. They might not. But what would be your advice to Yo Gotti? This is his label. His brother got killed. That was number two. And they're tying him to this horrendous crime of the assassination of Young Dolph. What would you advise them to do? Is he in trouble facing a, a RICO? His organization for what? If they're connected like that, the paper trail. <laughs> I'd vote. Kamala Harris has asked the hell out of any public office and anything that had to do with them. These guys just throw stuff, even if they don't have stuff. So anyway, 
I mean, uh, but the, what do you think about this? I know you did some coverage of the YSL Rico trial, Young Thug, and them down in Atlanta. Yeah, is rap the new organized crime? Is hip hop new organized crime? Rap no, it's not the new organized crime. It's been what it's been for years. Uh, the Jewish run uh, industry makes a lot of money off of it internationally. So there's this up and down where people fight over the crumbs and fall mm -hmm. off big table. So uh, there is this downing of masculinity all around the world and young people from Tokyo to Berlin, they look at the imagery of gangster rap video and it looks masculine to them. So they crave it. And if it ain't broke, don't fix it. So it sells internationally. In fact, more so almost than it does in America. So the people that deal with the distribution, they don't want any changes. Some of the artists want to run changes, but the only thing they are permitted to do unless they rebel is to get fouler about what they're saying and uh, more irrelevant and harmful. So they fight amongst themselves for status, which is encouraged because if you're going to be a thug, I, it helps if you have some street cred with it. Now, it's, it's interesting because you saying all that, I was thinking about years ago back in the 90s because I, I love Tupac, I love rap and all that, but C. Dolores Tucker and Reverend Calvin Butts were very critical of the content produced by these uh, artists. And I used to, like, you know, I thought they were, like, fuddy-duddies, they was out of touch, but now I'm looking at what's been happening in the last 30 years I think they was riding the money to try to police some of this stuff that's being put out there as so-called yeah. music. Well, see, I was out at UCLA in the 60s. I mm -hmm. graduated before the 60s were out. And I heard the plots and the plans out there. And Hollywood was trying to get the movie industries back on their feet since mm -hmm. television was knocking them out. They got the idea that instead of having the format of two movies every Thursday and Sunday changing, no matter what, get one, run it as long as people would come. You could save money in the production. And if you went after the Negro, no black, no Afro-American, mm -hmm. no black. You know, they really want to see themselves so we can make a lot of money off of them. And OK, are we going to try to lift them up or just go to the lowest common denominator and get the money? Let's go to the lowest common denominator. Meanwhile, they are a big threat. So let's go propagandize them so they will mess themselves up. And you started getting 50 years of glorification of dysfunction that spread through the whole country. And a lot of it was predicated for another reason just besides getting black folk down. In fact, I suspect mm -hmm. in retrospect that the objective wasn't so much to get black folk down as to use black folks since a lot of the young white guys thought black guys mm -hmm. were the mm -hmm. epitome of masculinity they would follow so it was a good way to get masculinity in the country to self-destruct right. and that came out of the war the mm -hmm. because there was this thing about war is a man thing so you have to change boys the way they are raised so they don't become men and they become emotional and they can cry and you know, they can think about the soft. It is all about love, man. You know, mm -hmm. it's nonsense. So we come here and uh, opportunistic people fell for the game. Some of the female persuasion, they fell for the welfare trap and got subsidized out of the job market and advancement in society and just became slaves on a plantation with no cotton. Mm -hmm. And the other enterprising 
group on the other side went into you know man it's all about pimping and bitches and hoes man you know like you got to run your bitches man and mm. they started simping more than pimping mm. and that ramped up into a whole lot of other negative stuff you got super fly you had yeah. uh, black caesar glorifying the drug trade and murder and you got hopelessness no cause no purpose and you have a real life mess and then you get the exploitation on the other end like the incompetents that are in office here in memphis they can't even walk out in the streets except some of the older ones who aren't is into what some of the newer ones like you know out the mayor, he's got to go out with eight cops to guard him every place he goes, even to a restaurant, folks folly. Uh, you know, it's interesting. You see Doc Harrington, he's hanging around in. Uh, I know you like Houston's or something like Houston. that. You was yeah. stomping around uh, back then. By himself. Yeah, but you see the current mayor, he can't even go to an affair without eight cops, two squad cars tied up bodyguarding him. You see Cohen, the congressman, he's got mm -hmm. three black SUVs meet him at the airport every time he flies. And you see the eighth district congressman, his wife comes and picks him up. So what's going on here? They've got a mess in this damn city. They don't know what to deal with, how to deal with it don't have a clue and it's kind of ludicrous because in the past you know the people that ran stuff they were kind of gangsters so they could pull it off these are just punks and sissies and they go out there and they rip the people off so there's nothing for anybody from old to young to look at well you know what i'm glad you brought that up and it, it showed you how how weird memphis is and backwards because people criticize Dolph for coming back to the hood. He didn't have a lot of bodyguards. He only had his brother with him at the cookie shop, making a cookie run for his mom. But he was very comfortable with the old neighborhood and stuff. He did things for the community. Yeah, which I did. think it, well, well, I think it's sad though, because you look at Atlanta, I look at Killer Mike, I look at T.I., I look at how they're well-respected in their communities, how they're able to operate and open businesses, how they had a, how they have direct line to the city hall, to the mayor's office, how they get that respect. Dolph should have had that same type of uh, respect if he was trying to do stuff. See, my thing is, yeah, the music could have been better, but where are the elders? Where are the, the guidance of the people? They say, brother, I love what you're doing, but you could do it like this. This man was still a young man, but he had courage to come back well, home and invest in people. Yeah, and He got shot down for it. Yeah, but you see, the point is, when I grew up in South Central L.A., mm -hmm. you could walk around the corner, even from junior high school. You mm -hmm. looked around to see who the hell was down there because you didn't right. want to run into the right people, <laughs> uh, wrong people. Yes, sir. And if you're going to go gangster, you have to take the precautions and he doesn't need to be making a cookie run for his mama and his mama doesn't need to be sending him out there. You know where you saw this whole thing? Mm -hmm. is remember boys in the hood where the mama, oh, yeah. you know ice cubes character she couldn't mm -hmm. stand his daddy so the one she loved that was the dummy that played football ricky yeah yeah he went down and he's scratching off on a instant win thing and uh -huh. he's looking and that's how that was where i grew up Mm. Actually, that was the Crenshaw area, and Crenshaw, when I was around, got better, but I was over on 58th place in Normandy, if you know L.A., mm -hmm. and 58th, 62nd, Bud Long Avenue Elementary, John Mayer Junior High, so, you know, we came to school one day. I was in the ninth grade and somebody that had just graduated from the ninth grade and gone to Manual Arts High School. We came in hanging from the flagpole. This dude was hung by the rope for the flagpole mm -hmm. and his pants were off except around one ankle and somebody had slid his belly open. So his guts are hanging down about eight or nine feet pooled on the ground, smelled like the devil. 
bloody mess and flies all over the place. We just said, man, do must have messed up. Who did he get mad? Wow. And by the way, we didn't get 15, 20 counselors coming in there because, oh my God, the students are suffering from post traumatic stress syndrome. Oh my God. <laughs> like, we just said, damn, dude, must have gotten somebody real angry. And, That's a message, yes, yeah, sir. And we just went on in the class, like, damn, man. This before like rap music, right? So this always been there. That violence always been. That's yeah. part of America, though. That's America. Yeah, but always see, been violent. But you see, there's another thing too about mm -hmm. um, 1965 August. When we had that uprising that some people called a riot, it wasn't like with the way they do now, where it was just total frustration. There was a mm -hmm. purpose to it, and a lot of hostility and aggression got uh, taken away. And I remember I had a girlfriend, uh, she lived about eight, nine blocks from where the whole thing started. Mm hmm. And I went over to visit her. So she had run with her dad someplace on an errand. And her mother wanted me to go to the local convenience store to pick up, I think, milk or something like that. Mm -hmm. So I did. And when I'm walking out, there's this dude standing on the corner. He's going, man, where are you from, man? I said, well, I'm independent, man. He said, well, yeah, all right, man. Uh, next time, I'm just standing there watching. Somebody came up. Where are you from, man? Dale Viking, man. Are you all right? Where are you from, man? De La Soul, man. Where are you from? De La Soul, man. Where are you from? Business, man. Make your run, fool. Boom, boom, boom. Fire three caps at him. Mm -hmm. Well, the interesting thing is, is two weeks after everything settled down, I'm running another errand for my girlfriend's uh, mama, right? So mm -hmm. I come out, same situation. This dude's just standing on the corner. You know, I'm saying, oh, man, here we go again. So mm -hmm. when this guy came down around the corner that he had fired three shots at, he said, hey, man. He said, man, what you want, man? He said, man, I want to apologize, man. I was foolish, man. You know, like, hey, I apologize, man. Mm -hmm. So everybody, well, you know, burn, baby, burn, man. You know, that was from Roscoe to Magnificent, you know, he popularized that in LA. That was this thing before the uprising. So there wasn't there worked but two black on black homicides for the next year and a half in LA. There were no robberies, no rapes, no assaults, uh no burglaries, you name it. LAPD wouldn't go in there unless they were riding six deep in a squad car and they'd look straight ahead from which is a difference they used to go out like hunting stuff a mm -hmm. minute people mm -hmm. standing on the bus stop uh waiting for a ride you know hey man you don't like this guy you want a piece of this here it is we'll have to take our guns off man you want a piece of this action like what the hell are you doing <laughs> see that's the way it used to be in la but after that, it just smoothed out. And when they had that ride, it was interesting. If there was a Korean business, uh, Jewish, mm -hmm. business, didn't make any difference what. If they treated the people nice, somebody or somebody's would stand out front and say, hey, leave these guys alone. They treat us all right. And they'd go on. But every place that treated folk in a ratchet fashion, uh-uh, they were gone. And all of the ragged falling down buildings they got burnt to the ground but they put people to work to clean it up and in two or three months it looked like they had had um an inverse gentrification process where the hood got cleaned up and all of the right. clap crap tore down broke down trashed out places were gone mm -hmm. so there was a buildup. johnson was in office and Black folk did not look at Lyndon Baines Johnson as a villain. They looked at him as Abraham Lincoln number two, 2.0. Mm -hmm. Johnson 
said, I shall not seek nor accept the nomination of my party for another term as president. People just fell apart. And when Nixon got in, they just kind of gave up hope. And by then, most of the organizations that had sprung up to do something in the community were infiltrated by snitches, whores, uh, pimps, simps, agents, officers, undercover, you name it. So you walked in and there 45 people in there, 20 of them are working for somebody or trying to destroy the whole operation. So it just kind of fell apart. And then the gang started coming back up. And one young man that had been on my playground when I was a playground director, Tookie Williams, mm -hmm. he kept, he helped co-found the Crips. So, mm -hmm. you know, it is what it is. But like, well, I'm thinking, I'm listening to everything you're saying. But my thing is, like, even when they think about Tupac and Dr. Matulu Shakur, his stepfather, they develop a code called the Thug Life Code. You had people that had a G code back then, like even the Chicago Jeff Fort and Larry Hoover. They had a G code. You had a code of the streets that everybody had to respect if they're going to engage in this game. There are no rules. Like even with the young golf, I mean, I keep on this weird young Dolph and Yo Gotti situation. Where are the OGs saying y'all need to calm down, to de-escalate? We don't have no elders well, to step here, in like that with that type of status in the, in the, the hoods. Difference. Here's the difference. Mm -hmm. What you're calling OGs, we weren't OGs at the time. We were you. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. what we did, it was kind of a self-deception. We fantasized that we were revolutionaries. Okay. So. And there they go. Judge about to drop this knowledge. There they go. There they go. See, they, it's a. Okay. okay, I got you, Judge. You, we here. Yeah. Yes, sir. Uh, okay, see what happens is we fantasized that we were revolutionaries. Uh, mm -hmm. We started talking about, are you ready for the revolution? And, mm -hmm. you know, you dress so that if it hit the fan, you would be ready. Mm -hmm. We were not ideating on being gangsters and thugs and pimps and, you know, celebrities and drug dealers and all of that kind of thing. So, we kind of just said, man, you know, I'm bailing on this. A lot of us, we just sit around and talk about it, man. I'm bailing on this. You can't go back to this. It's so infiltrated, man. We all wind up dead in jail. And see, they were killing people. Mm -hmm. And I'm not talking about killing people for gangster stuff. I'm talking about those three-letter organizations were going around literally killing people. Going to and, yeah. you know, like you get... 1969 you say man i know 17 people that i knew three years ago that were active in the movement they're dead now see it mm -hmm. wasn't just martin luther king it was all of the young leadership was being gunned down or whatever so it was like you were in a war zone uh people didn't go anywhere where they weren't armed if you were active it's like yeah you might be violating the law with concealed carry but it was better than just being gunned down and not being able to take anybody with you so right right it was kind of a a situation that was intense and we were looking at stuff like the battle of algiers and reading franz fanon's wretched of the earth and things like that Mm -hmm. looking at Africa audio, which you should see if you can ever find a copy, a very graphic, very graphic documentary about what was going on in Africa. And this is how we rolled. But then, you know, within a very few years, this welfare receipt thing and all of the baby mamas who had decided that having babies Mm -hmm. so they could get a check and do nothing else but flag back to get it and the ones that wanted to go revive the old gang thing it was like man this is going downhill real fast they got no time for this and we tried to talk to them and you could mm -hmm. but the problem was is they lost their manhood and that's mm -hmm. what i have a problem with that feminization of the country was spreading fast from the bottom up. And you mm -hmm. talk to guys and it ideate like girls, you know, like gold diggers. 
You know, mm-hmm. it's like, man, what's wrong with you, man? They don't think like this, and we're just in our mid twenties, right? Man, what's the matter with you? Well, man, I'm gonna get my women. Man, what do you mean a woman take care of you, fool? Men don't do that, but you see, that's by the mid seventies, and it got poisonous worse from there, from the bottom up. And rap, which was interesting, it started out kind of a fascinating way. Mm-hmm. You had people who rapped like Gil Scott Heron, uh, Jackson, Tennessee is where he's from. Right. With the Jazz Messengers, you had uh, Louis Armstrong, Satchmo Armstrong. He put that trumpet down and get to talking. You know, mm-hmm. it, it's nothing new, but it changed in terms of what it was about. And it was, at first, it wasn't bad. They had these events in New York where you had the DJs. And the DJs would throw these block parties outside, and they'd get on the mic while they're spinning records, and they'd get to talking. Mm -hmm. So they would have these competitions in New York, Chicago, and a little bit, but not much in L.A. because rap didn't really hit L.A. And they would have contests to see who can run the best game. And see, that came from a time when most of the people from 35, 40 under were used to running the dozens where, you know, that was our recreation out on the playground, you know, for recess or lunch. You'd be talking about, yeah, man, I want to say nothing about your mama, man, but blah, 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 blah. <laughs> so everybody would have these witty comebacks and everybody get to laugh and it would be great entertainment. So they would have contests to see who was essentially uh, not so much the best stand-up comedian, but mm-hmm. who had the best lines. And then it went from ego rap, which is what I called it back in the 70s, which was I'm so this, I'm so that, you know, uh, which wasn't bad. And then it started morphing into something a bit darker and then darker. And then it started to be glorification straight flat out of this function. And then the N word got popular, which had just sort of disappeared from the black vocabulary, except from the women on welfare. And they were the only ones that were using that N-word about the early 1970s. But they taught all these babies they had who, by the time you got to the 80s, they were in their late teens or early 20s, and it got to be real poisonous. So the Black problem that I'm looking at with the whole industry right now is it's too feminized. Too many of the rap stars, uh, artists, they're into what happens when some people come out of the penitentiary and they don't get rid of their sexual taste that they acquired or perhaps perfected in the penitentiary. I have a friend that was doing a thing 30 years ago on, shall we say, sexuality in the prisons and in the jails. And the stats were as if somebody did nine months um, time, there was a 92% probability that they had engaged in multiple homosexual contacts, either voluntary or involuntary. And I know I had clients that get out whereas before they went in, they'd have four lady friends putting up the fee for them. And when they got out, they'd have one or two lady friends and be living with four, you know, and the lady friends would want their money back. Lawyer Brown, I want my money back, honey. Why? I mean, you're not going to get it. Well, what's the matter? That fool, he got, he got two boyfriends. He'd be down there and he'd be stealing my cortex because his butt be bleeding. <laughs> And you know, Ooh. I ain't going. Go hey, you know, Vice young. President Tampon Tim, right? Or potential Vice President Tim. He believed Bill Tampons and Boys Restroom. But Joe, I want to ask. I got to back it up because you got me thinking. Like you said, how the movement was decimated by government interference. Quote, you know, like in that so wasn't ways. government interference. It's like bait. Mm-hmm. They put it out there. You didn't have to take it. 
but it was so easy. Mm. See, it started off with the young sisters. All they had to do was flat back and get a check. Mm -hmm. I'll tell you one little anecdote that explains it. Okay. We had a program in the late 60s. Uh, mm -hmm. Dr. Cliff Stewart, the late uh, martial artist supreme. And mm -hmm. myself and some other people, we got together with a couple of black professors out at UCLA and we put this together and we dealt with the Black Student Alliance around Los Angeles. So in those days, before Ronald Reagan started doing his thing, the University of College Education in California was essentially free. Mm -hmm. You needed money to live off of. So we would get people money to live off of and we would be able to get them in some kind of college or university in the L.A. County area. So we I remember we went to where was that? Uh, Nickerson Gardens mm. out there in L.A. And we had four sisters that volunteered and they were filling out the paperwork in the rec room and me and Cliff and this guy named John, we were talking to the folk and we were getting, man, this for real? What I gotta do, man? I gotta get the hell out of here. Mm -hmm. I can't, man, my brother got shot last week, man. He survived, man, but I gotta get the hell out of here. So we'll, paperwork's over in the red room go do it and we'll assess it and find some place we can get you in but i promise you we'll get you in sister came up i gotta get the hell out of here mm. this is just poison now this mm -hmm. particular sister i have in mind actually made something she wound up getting a phd she was from the hood but she helped it out she died of breast cancer mm. years later and all of her children went and did something in the la area well, okay, we get to the next some fool. Look, my social worker tell me I got to come down here. Y'all sign this shit. I ain't going to work. I, you think I'm going to? Hell no. All I'm going to do is flat black and pop. And I'm giving myself a check all I need. And all you fools sitting up there trying to sniff up on it anyway. Well, no, we're not signing off on a damn thing. Not to help you out to do that. You know, you need to be being a self-sustaining black person. I ain't self-sustaining nothing but a gap in my legs and get myself knocked up and get a bigger check. Well, the actual fact of the matter is she died in a shootout in an armed robbery. Her brother got killed who was in there. And to show you how absolutely ridiculous it was, she already had mm -hmm. some children. She had had one kid when she was 11 years old. So when that kid was 16, he was with mommy trying to do an armed robbery. So her 16-year-old son got shot to death. She got shot to death, and her brother got shot to death in an armed robbery. That's how she wound up. But she wound up having 17 kids. Mm. And that was back before they started cutting the check off, saying this is all you're going to get no matter how many you have. It took a while for the word to get around, but it started well it removed the incentive and i had that when i was a judge i told you about that incident yeah, 57 year old woman i'll repeat it briefly mm -hmm. I had a 57 year old woman in my courtroom 1994 charged with felony drug and theft charges she had a 43-year-old daughter in there. She had a 34-year-old granddaughter in there. She had a 21-year-old great-granddaughter, and the 21-year-old great-granddaughter had an 11-year-old great-great-granddaughter, and the 11-year-old was pregnant with her second child, which would be the great-great-great-granddaughter, and this woman mm -hmm. isn't but 59 years old by the time all this developed. And the 11 year old had become 13 and the 21 year old had become 23. So by the time this woman 59 in 1996 mm -hmm. got to 2000, she was 63 and she had like 3,400 lineal descendants. 
She had one idiot in my courtroom who was a great, great grandson. That fool was 29 years old and had 61 outside kids by 57 different baby mamas. Mm, wow. See, that's one of the problems that nobody talks about. So some of that got to be poison. And if you look at the rap thing, it's kind of interesting when you see in your mind's eye what you're looking at. Mm -hmm. You see in the, the video, you see the half naked women bouncing around and it looks like they're sexual objects to the guy that is doing the rapping. Actually, the truth of the matter is, is uh, that's his mama, his grandmama, his favorite aunts and their friend girls. And if you saw them, a generation or two behind uh, where they are right now with the imagery they have, you would have seen grandmama in 1990, 1989, 86. She's mm -hmm. sitting out 42 years old, which isn't that old, but she's got on a little bitty halter and some knit hot pants or shorts with her butt cheeks all out. She's drinking a 40 ounce and smoking a joint. She's trying to get laid and her daughter out there is half naked too. And so are all the rest of her children, her daughters mm -hmm. and their friend girls and the sexual objects that you see on the screen are the female relatives. So somebody's got to have street cred to be able to play that off these days because that's the kind of thing that the international market wants and the Jewish community that's making great profit off of this is pushing. I don't have anything against them for being able to find a fool that would do that, but that's money well, in the bank for a lot of people but us. But you know, the thing about I want to get back to the 69, you talking about how 1969, people don't understand at the beginning of 69, you lost two of your classmates, John Huggins and Apprentice Bunchy Carter. Yeah. At the I end of 69, now, now at the end of 69, you lose Chairman Fred Hampton and Mark Clark in Chicago. And what I want yeah, people to well, understand, well, I want people to understand this because like, I got to make it plain because people got to understand the government did interfere in the black community being decimated. And I'm talking about a couple ways. Whereas oh, you know, young yes, young Dolph, did. young Dolph, he reminds me. People we used to joke. He kind of looked like Stokely Carmichael, Kwame Torrey. He he got he kind of looked like him. You know, Kwame Torrey or Stokely Carmichael was very gifted with the oratorical skills. Same thing with H. Rap Brown. So you 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 the rappers would have been the revolutionaries sixty years ago. They would have been revolutionaries. They co and tell pro the revolutionaries to becoming just entertainers. And, no, and, and here's being, the thing: the difference. But I'm gonna say, well, 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 but being subversive. Now, also go back to black exploitation, where you had sweet back badass song, which was about being revolutionary. Earth, wind, and fire did the soundtrack. Dr. Bill Cosby helped finance that for Melvin Van Peebles, but then they used that to say revive Hollywood through black exploitation. Everything that deals with black people is about empowering other folks, but they use us to yeah. be exploited. That's the end game. But also. James Earl Jones just passed. I want people to look at the movie Claudine with him and Diane Curl, where James Earl Jones was a sanitation worker. He was his, uh, Diane Curl's boyfriend, Claudine's boyfriend. But when that little petite white social worker would come to the home, well, he had to go here to hide in the closet. He's a man that had to hide in the closet, but the government have utilized their resources to break up the family, starting with the black family. Because she yeah, couldn't get no, no resources from the government. Cause she had all them kids if she had a man in the house. So well, the government see, always been complicit thing. in breaking up the black family from the days of slavery. Yeah. See, here's the thing. When I first started at legal services here in Memphis, that's 50 years ago. Our, one of our number one cases types of case was getting a check cut back on after some social worker was sitting at the end of the block with binoculars watching to see if some man went by to take care of his son or daughter out of the multiple children that this woman may have had and play daddy for the rest of them. So mm -hmm. that just got blocked out. The other thing too, was this ratchet juvenile court down here. Yeah. Uh, judge that ain't none of my child. She been websing with this white man, boy, don't you put no white man's uh, 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 name in your mouth. Turner was a judge down there. He'd used the N word freely up in open court. Say, nigga, just don't say nothing to me up in here. You better not dare put that white man's name in your mouth. 
tell you what, uh, mm -hmm. dark as you are, you keep feeding that boy and he'll darken up to look just like you. See, so people, you know, this was the game. They had to name a father and nobody wanted to be bothered because of the ratchet way they were running stuff down at juvenile court. They didn't have DNA test or anything then. And these guys were getting people put on them that weren't their children. And years later, I did a lot of pro bono work just helping mm -hmm. folk down there. And, you know, you'd go in and you'd sneak a DNA test. And this guy's been paying for 12 years on a kid ain't even his. He never did claim. He just got told you sign or you go to jail. And see, there was a lot of that. So it was just destroying the black community. But one difference between Stokely Carmichael, H. Rap Brown, and such back then, you didn't push moving drugs. Panther Party didn't push moving drugs. Mm -hmm. Panther Party, John Huggins and Bunchy Carter, I recruited them to UCLA. Hell, I was in the building when the killing went down. Somebody kicked in my door, and this is something that didn't even get published. My door and somebody else's and mm -hmm. some other assassins went up there. I wasn't in my office, but they put four bullet holes in the back of my chair. Me and Elaine Brown were just leaving when these folk ran down the hallway, you know, and John had been shot twice in the back. He was dead, mm. but he didn't know it quite then. And he fired six shots at them running right past Lane and I going down the hallway, he hit one of them in the back. He flinched, but he kept running. But by the way, he hit him in the back with a three fifty seven Magnum. So <laughs> He just okay. kept running and they never did get him. Mm -hmm. So, you know, this was the way they went. And it was, they were part of the US organization, Ron Karinga and the US organization. By the way, they started Kwanzaa for the specific purpose of getting black folk to talk. And I went to the first session they had in Lemurry Park, 1966 on Crenshaw. Mm -hmm. And they had this peculiar habit, they'd walk around and he had gotten some of his followers trained and taken shorthand. Brother, what you taking shorthand notes for? To my line, needs to know what's going on. Three weeks later, the FBI calls you in and they're quoting you exactly. Yeah, this dude took the shorthand notes. And then found out when they started scaring LAPD, LAPD had this SIS unit, Special Investigative Services Unit, that they mm -hmm. sicked on black folk. And you'd get these other cops that would start collaborating with you because they got scared because they said something is going on. <laughs> <You> know, this, <laughs> ain't, this ain't cool up in here. We, why are we not, you know, we can't meet at the police station. It ain't safe. You will, man. I'm, you know, we ain't talking about you. We're talking about us. Oh. You know, not us, the organization. But, uh -huh. you know, uh hmm. it got weird and then there was ronald the freeze mm -hmm. uh you should read his book if you can get it the glass house tapes glass house one glass house two he wrote two books and he was supposed to be a brother that got back from the nom who had been a medic so injuries you know, is that tackwood is that tackwood what's his mm -hmm. name tack no, not DeFreeze, Tackwood, Lewis Tackwood. Yeah, DeFreeze yeah. was with the Che Lamumba thing. Yeah, yeah. Not you know him. Y'all went to high school, right? The... Y'all go to high school together? Yeah, I went to high school with uh, Ronald <laughs> DeFreeze. It was Patty Lewis Hurst. Tackwood. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Tackwood. Uh -huh. I talked to you about that, but I'm just... That book is hard to find, but I, I found it. But on Amazon, it's like a thousand dollars or something like that. It's like ridiculous. Like they track like information. I've got one in my safe. Yeah, I've got a, worth a lot I've of money. Got a new, I got yeah. a new copy in my safe, and I've read both of them several times before. But mm -hmm. Lewis Tackwood, mm -hmm. not the freeze. That was right. Sinke. Mm -hmm. uh, the Patty Hearst thing, but yeah. Patty yeah. Hearst thing, yeah. SLA. With, by the way, another crook attorney general of California, Evel Younger, mm -hmm. who, if you've been reading Tackwood's book, you see how he puts Evel Younger in there and some of the stuff he, they did, including burglarizing Angela Davis's place, stealing the guns and planting them. 
in that van and wiring up that 15 year old to go bust off in that courthouse. But anyway, we thought Tackwood was a former medic in the knock. So he was going mm -hmm. around treating people for the mm -hmm. injuries received. And he was there for a lot of stuff. But I remember when I got in law school, I did this field project, which is watching this murder trial going on. So I'm sitting there and they bring in, who the hell did they bring in? Louis Tackwood. I said, oh shit. You know, damn, <laughs> damn, damn. Started feeling real nervous. Oh man. You know? <laughs> uh, and I said, he was a snitch, damn. But it uh -huh. turned out, he said, we would like to please state your name for the record. Lewis Tackwood, what is your rank? I said, rank? I said, Lieutenant <laughs> Los Angeles <laughs> Police Department, SIS unit. I said, I just know it was a cop. <laughs> Wasn't just a live cop. He like Donnie a, Brasco. On, buddy. <laughs> a lieutenant. But he didn't tell on everybody. He didn't tell okay. everything. Okay. I said, man, damn. And I knew the dude, you know, I don't know. Is hell. he still around? Is he still alive? Or I you don't have know? no idea. He, I bet protection. you he could tell you some stories. Because you remember mm -hmm. he was talking about Captain Franco, how he set Franco up where they put him in the jail cell. Mm -hmm. And some gangsters were in there. They were doing drug trade stuff. And he said, yeah, that no good so-and-so. He squealed on me. Who is that? Uh. Franco, you mean Diggs? Yeah, that was him. And they had just put Tackwood in that cell. That's in Glass House, too, I think. Okay. But anyway, it was insidious what they were doing. They just wiped that off the face. And I think one of the problems was is that people were too naive uh, mm -hmm. at a point where there actually was an opportunity to do something with it. I wish I had had this sophistication then that I do now and I try to teach it to people but they don't want to listen and everybody's talking about unity unity well mm -hmm. yeah if you're not unifying with the very devil and uh you've got people now that are being pushed by mainstream media and I'll say this the biggest bastion of racism in the United States of America is in the communications and entertainment uh media fields Mm -hmm. The worst racist I've ever encountered in my life are not here in the South, not Alabama, not Mississippi. They're in Hollywood. Yeah, I've been in the mm -hmm. The mainstream media is part of that thing out there. It's on the far left, and what they're trying to do is emasculate the country, starting with black folk first. Right. And oh. Confirmation, confirmation, judge. Are you still in the house, judge? See, this is what I'm talking about. This is what they do. This judge Joe Brown's all new barbecue sauce and seasoning, justice in the form of flavor. Law firms will take this as a retainer. What? It must be a law firm when they hungry as hell. Now you gonna help me with this parole I'm dealing with? <laughs> 